I'm welcome, welcoming uh, all of our panelists and attendees to today's uh, uh, webinar on the Green Belt and Road. Uh, we have uh, a number of uh, diplomatic representatives, excellencies. Uh, we have uh, uh, some experts and uh, we have uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're very happy to have you in this uh, discussion and dialogue, which I hope will uh, present a number of points, clarify. Uh, the Belt and Road Institute in Sweden has worked uh, over a number of, uh, of uh, years now, uh, several years, in promoting this kind of clarity on the importance and uh, relevance of the Belt and Road Initiative, which um, I think everyone here is relatively well aware of. Uh, it is our task and continues to be to promote cooperation and accuracy and truth in how the Belt and Road can be a vehicle for global development, which at this point in history is a crucial and highly relevant factor for maintaining the proper pathway for human development. Uh, there will be a number of, uh, of uh, presentations uh, which will address this question. Uh, I will mention that uh, briefly now uh, that <clears throat> one of the speakers who unfortunately, uh, diplomatic speakers, the ambassador from Laos, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Bunviep uh, Huang, Von Sone uh, could not attend as he had planned. Uh, there is a counselor who will be an attendee, not a speaker. But I will just mention that uh, the one of the major uh, infrastructure projects uh, that he would have mentioned is the near completion now of the uh, Belt and Road China Laos Railway which is about 414 kilometers from uh, Hunan, China's southern border to uh, Vientiane, which is Laos's capital, and opens the possibility for enormous uh, development and trade, not only between China and Laos, but Vietnam and, uh, and uh, uh, Thailand and other relevant <clears throat> nations in South, Southeast Asia. So I just mentioned that because it is opening according to schedule on the 2nd of December and uh, perhaps there will be another opportunity for him or someone else from the embassy to develop that point. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, the Shars, I want to welcome also naturally our uh, friends from the uh, Embassy of China, uh, the Charles de Fer, uh, Mr. Xian <coughs> Biao, uh, and uh, he will be speaking on uh, behalf of uh, China's uh, Green Belt and Road. Uh, the uh, uh, founder of the uh, of let's say the Green Way of Development and Life was initiated by President Xi Jinping at a forum in Davos in uh, January of this year. But as we underline, and I hope this point will be elaborated, uh, the question of a green and uh, proper response to the question of environment and climate is not in any way excluding the necessity for development as a goal for mankind. And this is very clearly a part of China's initiative. So I would like to first and foremost right now, welcome the Charles de Fer from the Embassy of China. And uh, you're most welcome to present uh, your, uh, your ideas. 
Mr. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stephen. Yeah, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and uh, gentlemen, dear friends, uh, good morning. It gives me great pleasure to join you at the webinar, Earth is Mankind's Only Home. Green and sustainable development is a trend. For a long time, people find it hard to keep the environment and the economic growth both at once. Protecting the environment often came at a cost of growth and vice versa. This has become clear to China as early as the 1980s. And since then, China started to work for a path that allows both environment protection and economic development. Under the strong leadership of the Communist Party of China, we found a path of high quality development one that prioritizes environmental protection and no carbon development. Here, I'd like to share three of our green philosophers with you. First, green concepts drive sustainable development. As President Xi Jinping stressed, mankind and nature form a community of life. In this community, we must respect nature, protect it, and follow its north. We believe green mountains are golden mountains and environmental protection and ecological growth are mutually inclusive instead of exclusive. A well preserved environment is valuable both ecolo ecologically and economically. One tested and trusted way is to use the nature to de develop industry with regional characteristics and promote environmentally friendly economic growth. We may also fully mobilize economic factors such as land, workforce, assets, and nature through reform and innovation to turn green mountains into golden mountains by unleashing their ecological value. In this sense, a green and a no carbon economic system that promotes a society wide green transformation is a path to long term stability, uh, uh, sustainability. Second, green actions speak louder than words. In his written speech to COP26, President Xi stressed that regions will come true only when we act on them. China announced its goals to strive for emission peaking by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060. In his remarks at the UN General Assembly in September, he reiterated those scares and further announced that China will not add overseas coal fired power projects. Recently, China released two directives working guidance for carbon dioxide peaking and carbon neutrality in full and faithful implementation of the new development philosophy and the action plan for carbon dioxide peaking before 2030. Specific implementation plans for key areas such as energy, industry, construction, and transport, and for key sectors such as coal, electricity, iron and steel, and cement will be rolled out. Coupled with supporting measures in terms of science and technology, carbon sink, fiscal and taxation, and financial incentives taken together, these measures will form a one plus N policy framework for delivering carbon peaking and carbon neutrality, which clearly defined the timetable roadmap and the blueprint. In fact, China has delivered on its 2020 climate action target ahead of schedule. China's carbon intensity in 2021 was 48% lower than year 2005. The share of coal in energy portfolio dropped from 72.4% in 2005 to 56.8% in 2020. And the non-fossil fuel accounts for 16% of energy consumption. China has opened the world's largest carbon market 
and it's working to install the world's largest nuclear power capacity. China is also accelerating wind and solar power construction in desert regions and has started to install a capacity of 100 million kilowatts. Delivering on goals of carbon peaking and carbon neutrality requires a wide and profound transformation of our society and economy, which cannot be achieved without the hardest efforts. It took developed countries 50 to 70 years to move from carbon peaking to carbon neutrality, and China is committed to taking only 30 years. The time frame China promised is far shorter than developed countries, which means China, the world's largest developing country, will achieve the world's largest carbon emission reduction in the shortest period of time, a task that will undoubtedly need our hardest efforts. Third, green cooperation for women benefits. China has been fulfilling international responsibility suited to its national conditions by actively promoting green transition and scaling up climate actions. From remote Sensen climate satellites in African and the no carbon Thailand areas in Southeast Asia to energy conserving nights in island countries, China's climate cooperation with developing countries has yielded concrete results. China is also the biggest manufacturer of clean energy equipment. China will continue to help other developing countries to make their energy more efficient, clean and diverse, and support them in adopting green and no carbon development measures. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the Belt and Road Initiative in the new era is a green initiative that brings new opportunity of sustainable development to participating countries. The BRI Green Partnership that China launched this year has been met with broad welcome. In 2020, the share of renewable energy investments in the total of BRI countries' investment increased from 38% in 2019 to 57% in 2020. China puts tackling climate change high on BRI's agenda and promote coordinated progress of improving the environment and addressing climate change, as well as between carbon removal and economic growth. To, prom uh, to promote a green and no carbon recovery, for all BRI countries after the pandemic. As President Xi stressed, we need to create more opportunities for the world through China's development, deepen our understanding of the development of human society and share the knowledge with the rest of the world. Many BRI developing countries are at a historic transition period, facing the choice between the environment and the growth a choice once faced by developed countries. China is willing to use the BRI as a platform to share its green development practices with other BRI countries. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the green development philosophers of China and Sweden are highly compatible, which presents us with bright cooperation prospects Sweden has rich experience in green development and is home to a large number of innovative companies, both startups and big labs. They provide cutting edge technologies and solutions in areas of environmental protection, renewable energy, bio city, environmental engineering, a garbage converted energy industry and construction energy conversation biofuel and wind power. China has a huge demand for green industries. It is predicted that China's green industry will be worth 3.6 trillion US dollar in 2030, and China's green financial market will grow to 15.6 trillion US dollar in 2060. 
China is willing to work with all other countries, including Sweden, on the basis of mutual respect and equality and promote green development through innovation. China is also willing to actively expand practical cooperation on the bilateral level and with BRI countries to energize green development in China, Sweden, and elsewhere, and make contributions to the green cause of the world. Let me conclude by wishing the webinar great success. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Charles Defer, uh, Mr. Zhang. There's uh, very important uh, concepts and points to uh, initiate this kind of uh, dialogue and discussion. Uh, I would like to introduce the uh, ambassador now from uh, uh, from uh, Serbia, uh, Ambassador um, Momsilovic, <clears throat> who has uh, been a participant and friend of ours on other occasions, and I welcome him to <clears throat> inform us of some of the points from uh, the standpoint of Serbia in terms of promoting this type of Belt and Road, Green Belt and Road, but Belt and Road cooperation between uh, Serbia and in, in hopefully in some respects as well as between Sweden, Serbia and China. So you're most welcome, Ambassador. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Just to add uh, something, uh, uh, this is not my name, Husseini Askari. Please, I can see on my board to change my name. Oh, my name that's Dragan Momchiluic, just for others, you know, to know. <laughs> yeah, if you can change that. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, I'm really happy to participate in this seminar, Grinton Belt uh, Road. And as usual, I will give some data, some information about my country about economic development and also about this green transition that we are trying to do with our partners, European Union, and also with Serbia. I would like to say at the very beginning, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, but there is no ladies. I mean, Stephen, next time, please take care to invite some <laughs> ladies as well. No, <laughs> never mind. Uh, dear gentlemen, well, dear friends. There are attendees. You don't see them, but they. Ah, yeah, then, sorry. Then uh, let me talk, uh, my expose will be very brief and I, I, I will put it in the three parts, if I may say. First about Republic of Serbia, uh, we are uh, situated in the Western Balkans, you know, and we have 7 million people. And uh, as in most countries of Western Balkans, you know, we would like to enter European Union and we are doing a lot to, to, for the, our accession talks. And I think we are making progress on that. But I will discuss that these days we have very good economic situation. That means we can grow to about 6%. We attracted this year about 3 billion euro foreign direct investments. We are very proud of that. And that is very important for us. But in the same time, we must take care, not only foreign direct investments, but also environment, because we must live better as a, as a Serbian citizen. And also you will see soon we are demanding to enter European Union. And European Union, as you know, they have very high standards about the environment. Uh, let me uh, tell you that regarding the uh, political economic position of uh, Serbia, we are uh, now uh, doing accession talks more than about 10 years with the European Union. And European Union, our accession, the full membership is the main goal of the Republic of Serbia. Of course, we would like to balance all our political and trade relations with other partners. But again, I keep saying European Union is our orientation and we will enter uh, uh, European Union. But I must stress in this moment, that is the two way street. For one side, we have to fulfill all the conditions, a key communitaire according to the Treaty of Maastricht and all other things. And we are doing that. We are approximately on the halfway, you know, and we are happy to, to continue like that because we are improving our standard of living. But from other side, I must stress that also European Union member states are not ready for the moment for the large one. That's why on the recent summit in Slovenia, we could not get not only Serbia, all the Western Balkans could not get the date or time framework 
uh, when we can enter, and that will be very important initiative, having in mind again that we must uh, uh, accept and, and, and uh, solve all the IT communitaire with us. That is our homework and we will do it. Well, that is just about the position of Serbia. Let me uh, talk about China, uh, China-Serbia relations. That is a very important partner. We have excellent relations with China and I must uh, 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 say that uh, we are in the process of accession of the European Union, but we still have a breathing space, you know, to cooperate not only with China, but also with the United States, with Russia, with all the partners economically who are interested to invest in my country. And that's why we are very proud with China. What I can say is that uh, with China, I will mention all those projects and I will mention this environment component in those projects, you know, and just to know that we have uh, uh, approximately in last, uh, let's say 10 years, we have 8 billion euro of Chinese investments. We have uh, trade with China about 3 billion euro uh, per year. And that is very important. And of course, at the very beginning, I must say that we have very good political cooperation with China. We recognize one China policy, but also on the Chinese side, we got, you know, this approval that regarding the Kosovo problem, they did not recognize that part of the territory and we appreciate the Chinese point of view. Uh, regarding the concrete projects and uh, environment uh, uh, aspects, I, I would like to stay, uh, state that uh, China is very present in our steel industry and in mining industry. We have a huge uh, steel company that was uh, uh, held previous time by U.S. Steel, but U.S. Steel abandoned that, uh, you know, steel company. And thanks to Chinese and Chinese investments of a couple of billion dollars, we, this steel mill is working and producing good quality of steel. But also we have uh, put to the Chinese friends a certain environmental standards and they are respecting that standards and we are extremely happy about that. You know, then Chinese investments are also in the mining sector, very important with again, very high ecological standards and we appreciate what Chinese are doing there. But one of the most important uh, projects in, uh, in China, those are infrastructure projects that there are Chinese people with Serbian companies, with other companies are doing in Serbia. Transport is not only highways that thanks to Chinese, we are building highways and uh, bridges, but also uh, we are building very important uh, uh, rail link between Athens and Budapest. And uh, Serbia, Belgrade is in the heart of this project. And that uh, is great environmental aspect because uh, we won't use any more cars. We won't use a lot of other things, you know. We will just try to apply speedy trains on electricity and that will be our contribution to the environment. Also, I have to mention that China is present in Serbia with automotive industry. Also, uh, Chinese are present also with the French company to build the metro in Belgrade. And that is also a very important environmental aspect. I can add also that for the moment, Chinese investments are uh, employing about 10,000 people and working place from Serbia. Uh, if you want comparison, I would just mention that the German companies are uh, employing about 50,000 people, workers in, uh, uh, from Serbia. I mean, German companies in Serbia. That means my point is, that we are keeping balance in all projects and we are happy about that. Personally, I can say that I'm extremely happy that uh, Chinese bridge, very famous, uh, 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 Chinese built a very famous bridge over the Danube. That personally, I use every, every day to go to work in Belgrade and I'm extremely happy. But thanks to that bridge, you know, we got also surroundings of the bridge that is now business compound, business communities there. And definitely that approves our, our economic speedy development. What I can say at the end, you know, not to speak for a long time. Uh, today on the BBC News, I was listening about a conference, environmental conference that is going on in Glasgow. And now, as far as I know, it's closing day. Uh, then on, on that news, I, uh, there is a very important information that was given, and that is that China is doing great uh, great things about electric cars and the batteries. Uh, I can only imagine that half of the Chinese population are driving electric cars, and that would be great co uh, contribution to the, to the environment and to the, the, the climate change and, and all other aspects. That's all for me, and I'm open for the questions. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you very much, Ambassador. We have, uh, as you might see, your name has been correctly added to the uh, program. Apologize for any errors there. Uh, but uh, I think we uh, can move on. I would like to introduce the uh, next speaker from the Charles de Fer, uh, from Belarus, uh, Dmitry Matrulko. Uh, I can uh, mention briefly that uh, Belarus has, which many people are perhaps not really aware of, is a central uh, uh, nodal point in bringing uh, development and the Belt and Road uh, transport from uh, Asia and China into Europe. And they have already developed one of the largest uh, international great, it's called the Great uh, Stone Industrial Park, which uh, as far as I know, very little, if anything has been reported here in Sweden or in Scandinavia about this. But I think it's a very important uh, point that will probably emerge more in the coming year. But I am very happy to introduce the uh, Charles de Fer uh, from Belarus, Mr. Uh, Matrulko. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brower, uh, distinguished guests. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, the Belt and Road Institute in Sweden, for the invitation to this webinar. I would like uh, to say a few words about uh, participation of Belarus in the Green and um, Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road Initiative is progressing very fast, successfully connecting Europe with China. Uh, Belarus is proud to be an important part um, of this project. Currently, more than 100 million tons of goods transit through Belarus every year. We are strategically located um, on the new Eurasia land bridge with eight rail container routes between China and uh, Western Europe passing through our country. The shortest way from China to Sweden passes through Belarus. In 2010, uh, the leaders of Belarus and China signed uh, the agreement on the creation of the industrial park uh, Great Stone in Belarus as an important part of the Belt and Road Initiative. China recognizes it as the largest foreign industrial park built by China in the Eurasian region. Now, the Great Stone Industrial Park uh, has 80 residents from 15 countries and uh, developing very fast. They also invite uh, Swedish companies. One of Swedish companies now um, are getting um, status of resident of uh, Great Stone Industrial Park also. Greystone is a special economic zone which operates as a multinational manufacturing platform for innovative projects from all over the world. In the near future, the park will transform into a sm smart eco city, home for 100,000 people who will live, work, and enjoy high quality lifestyle there. Therefore, our priority is uh, to create and maintain an eco friendly environment in the park. Belarus also pays uh, great attention to R&D projects development, as well as transfer of innovations and new technologies. I'm convinced um, that the Belt Road Initiative creates new opportunities for cross-country cooperation and uh, sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we welcome uh, from our standpoint at the Belt and Road Institute in Sweden, uh, greater cooperation between Sweden and Belarus on economic uh, uh, development and orientation towards uh, further collaboration with the Belt and Road, which uh, I hope will advance uh, even in potential discussions and maybe webinars in the coming year. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I would like to welcome the commercial councillor uh, Mustafa from Pakistan. Uh, councillor Mustafa has been a friend. Uh, we had a uh, already this year in April an excellent uh, Belt and Road uh, in uh, uh, a policy forum. Uh, which I believe from uh, the number of attendees was extremely high, around almost 140, 
was a very successful and powerful uh, dynamic on uh, the basis of increased cooperation between China and Pakistan, primarily for development around the uh, uh, CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, and what that actually means for further development and uh, potentially, I think, a very important process in development between China, Pakistan, and hopefully uh, uh, very quickly in Afghanistan to stabilize the circumstances there as well. Uh, so I would like to give the word to uh, Councillor, uh, Commercial Councillor Mustafa, and welcome your uh, remarks on uh, how the <clears throat> CPEC and Pakistan uh, are working to improve this. I should say that uh, the Prime Minister uh, uh, Imran Khan has, uh, has already, and maybe you will mention this of course, emphasized the importance of this very recently in his op uh, public remarks. So we welcome you, Councillor Musta uh, Mustafa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stephen. Uh, first of all, uh, I must thank uh, BRICS for inviting uh, MC of Pakistan in Stockholm, Sweden uh, to participate, to speak uh, uh, in this event. Uh, Mr. Mustafa, I'm sorry, uh, this is the, the host. Uh, I tried to promote you as a panelist so people can see your video. Uh, but am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Uh, is that enough? <clears throat> I guess it should be enough. Okay. Go ahead, sorry. Okay, no problem. Uh, yes, I have seen uh, the theme of your webinar today and I've heard uh, the speakers who have spoken. Uh, normally when we talk about BRI, uh, it's taken as kind of uh, infrastructure uh, uh, project. It's, people think of roads and uh, uh, rail, railways and maritime connectivity. But if, if we look at uh, BRI uh, initiatives, as uh, uh, propagated by uh, Chinese government and the priorities set by uh, uh, Chinese government, these are in five areas. And uh, infrastructure uh, connectivity uh, is one of them. And the other areas of priority are, first of all, policy coordination, then it's uh, unimpeded trade, and then it's about financial uh, integration, and then it's about connecting people. The theme of your webinar, uh, uh, Green Belt and Road uh, Initiative, how uh, Belt and Road Initiative can uh, help to materialize a world with uh, climate-friendly uh, policies, climate-friendly uh, you know, initiatives, it falls, I guess, uh, under the first priority of uh, BR initiative, and that's policy coordination. That how different uh, countries uh, across the globe can coordinate their policies so as that this uh, infrastructure connectivity, this trade between um, global partners, it remains climate friendly and it doesn't result into uh, deterioration in um, uh, climate. Uh, as far as Pakistan is concerned, Pakistan is vibrant uh, partner of uh, Belt and Road Initiative, and uh, uh, China has uh, China and Pakistan um, have together uh, materialized ma major uh, projects uh, in Pakistan. For example, we have Gwadar Port. It has been uh, basically uh, established to uh, connect uh, Western China to the rest of the world. And uh, it provides, in fact, uh, savings in terms of uh, transportation costs, because if uh, goods from Western China go to other part of the world through land route, and then they go to uh, uh, Chinese coastal areas, uh, it costs a lot. But if they come from Gwadar, uh, to the, if they come to Gwadar port, and then they're shipped to the rest of the world, uh, it, it's, in fact, a lot of saving in terms of transportation. And uh, again, we have uh, a lot of uh, collaboration uh, uh, in terms of uh, developing 
a special economic zones. We have a good dozen of special economic zones. About half of them are operational. And uh, uh, companies from across the globe are coming and investing. And uh, they are setting up manufacturing uh, plants there. And all kinds of facilities are available uh, in these zones. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, there is a strategic uh, collaboration in energy, in green energy as well. We have set up uh, a solar park uh, uh, in one of our uh, district. It's called Bhavalpur. It's a uh, uh, major district in Pakistan. And we have developed uh, a solar park to produce uh, green uh, energy. And it's, of course, uh, all under this uh, collaboration uh, umbrella of uh, BRI and uh, CPAC, what we call China Pakistan Economic Corridor. And the CPAC, China Pakistan Economic Corridor, is in fact a part of uh, BRI. Yes, as a nation, we are committed to climate. Uh, we have set certain goals uh, for us. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, our prime minister uh, is very um, uh, determined to achieve these goals. And uh, beyond BRI, there's been a major uh, plantation uh, 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 kind of campaign in Pakistan. The goal was set initially 1 billion trees. Uh, it's a big number and uh, hopefully uh, we are going beyond that. But within um, yeah, BRI and within uh, industrialization uh, and th these special economic zones, uh, we have in fact issued uh, uh, a kind of uh, incentive, incentive regime where we are offering uh, redemption uh, uh, incentives to foreign companies or, and the local uh, partners who set up uh, green energy uh, projects. Uh, they have uh, exemption from import of plant and machinery. They have tax incentives. And of course, uh, if they kind of produce uh, energy and nobody buys, government is there to buy and include that uh, energy into our national grid. So uh, I, I would stop here. Uh, and I would again uh, appreciate uh, this initiative of BRICS to uh, connect these two major themes, this infrastructure connectivity through BRI and uh, keeping this uh, infrastructure connectivity uh, climate neutral uh, by uh, policy uh, coordination. Uh, and of course, I would be available for any uh, question further to explain any issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Stephen. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Mustafa. Uh, we will most definitely continue to uh, work together with Pakistan on promoting both uh, the benefits of how the Belt and Road has been uh, explicitly uh, changing and developing the landscape in Pakistan. Uh, so we look forward to more webinars in the coming coming period. I will just mention that there are 150 countries in the world that have actively been working with the Belt and Road uh, in one form or another. And the Belt and Road as a global development perspective is <clears throat> a good thing. It is something that uh, I believe would uh, from our position would be most beneficial to uh, open further collaboration between uh, our country here in Sweden, uh, between uh, Norway, uh, Finland, Scandinavia as a whole, and even other uh, major countries in Europe. The issue that I will, before I introduce our next speaker, uh, Mr. Erik Solheim, uh, I will say that the question of development, uh, which is a key part of the green agenda uh, for China, because it has always been the case that the development of human conditions is the most or crucial part of a good environment. When that has not occurred, poverty and uh, disease become a terrible factor in undermining the benefits for humanity. And China has already achieved a miraculous 
development in uh, lifting approximately 750 million of its population out of abject poverty. This should be a guide, guiding post for all of the world as a means by which it can, perhaps not in exactly the same way, but in each nation's ability to replicate that process of eliminating poverty. And I, I stress this because some discussions in environmental uh, factors do not seem to emphasize as China has been doing the development factor, the factor that development must go hand in hand with uh, a good environment. And this obviously is important for eliminating the problems of uh, human poverty and uh, underdevelopment, which are still uh, dramatic problems worldwide. So with that said, uh, I hope we will be having more representatives from uh, government spokesmen in, uh, in uh, Scandinavia to embrace the Belt and Road. Uh, but in the meantime, the former <clears throat> a political leader in Norway, Mr. Erik Solheim. Uh, he has also been uh, the uh, former UN Under Undersecretary General uh, and former Executive Director of the UN Environmentalist Program. And I give a short quote that he was give uh, that he gave in a recent uh, uh, article. Uh, in, in a newspaper, an interview, China has voiced opinions of the developing world, been a force for restraining, restrained, restraint and dialogue, and made sure the UN focused on economic development and the environment. Uh, Mr. Solheim is also uh, very active, and he will elaborate, hopefully, for all of us now, the Green Belt and Road Initiative, which he is working actively both with Chinese uh, and Norwegian colleagues and perhaps others, which he will name. And I welcome you to, uh, to our uh, Green Belt and Road Seminar, Mr. Solheim. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen, and good morning, Stockholm. Good afternoon, Beijing. <laughs> Uh, wherever you are uh, following this seminar. I'm great to be in touch with so many good people with an interest in what's happening in China and for sure uh, along the Belt and Road. Uh, this week, the Glasgow conference will come to an end and we will have a discussion all over the planet, how much was achieved. Some people will say quite something was achieved. I mean, India came there with some new, much higher ambitions, which is good. There was some agreement on deforestation, on methane, so there, there are, we can point to some, some achievements. And another will say that, well, this was far, far below expectations. We, we need to uh, uh, act a, a lot more urgently. I basically think this is the wrong question because it's not the diplomacy which is now driving the world. It's the political economy. Decision by main political leaders and the enormous forces of business which are driving the uh, green change which we need in this world. Then President Xi Jinping of China, just prior to the Glasgow conference, promised that China will now stop all investment and all financing of global of overseas coal investment. It's much more important than any possible outcome in Glasgow, because this is what will drive real change in the real world. Then Indonesia or Vietnam or Pakistan or Kenya or Ethiopia, South Africa, whatever nation, when they know that China will not invest in coal, they will of course request China to invest in solar and wind and green hydrogen and electric mobility and all those enormously promising environment technologies which China can deliver. Uh, so we see a sea change and Belt and Road will be a vehicle for this enormous green transformation which we need. I think this seminar has already set out how important uh, Belt and Road is. We heard about road construction and rail construction in the Balkans from Serbia. 
We heard about industrial parks from Belarus. We heard about tree planting and the port development in, in Pakistan. And before that, Stephen, you pointed to the uh, Laos-China Railroad, which will be finalized later this year. Let me add that just this week, while we are speaking, uh, the first metro in Vietnam was open in Hanoi, again, a Chinese-Vietnamese partnership. And of course, Vietnam, which is a very rapidly developing country with huge urban population that desperately need better transport systems. So such a metro is a fantastic uh, achievement for Vietnam that we support uh, from China. 130, 150 nations are, have been uh, associating themselves with Belt and Road in one form or the other. That's basically every single developing country in the world. I attended a foreign minister call hosted by Wang Yi, uh, the foreign minister of, of China just recently. Every single foreign minister of ASEAN countries were there. Every single foreign minister of South Asia except India was there. Every single foreign minister of Central Asia was there, added a huge number of foreign ministers and dignitaries from other parts, parts of the world. So this is the, by far, it's without competition, the biggest development scheme in the world. True, the G7 nations led by the United States promised in, in the UK earlier this year that they will set up another scheme to invest in developing countries. I hope they succeed because developing countries need more investment both from China and from the West. But at this point, uh, the Western led scheme is an ID, uh, while the Chinese scheme is an actually operational thing with enormous impacts on, on the world. We have formed uh, the Global Coalition for Green Belt and Road and the Green Belt and Road Institute. This is based by the uh, marching order from President Xi himself, who has said repeatedly that Belt and Road should be green and clean and based on the best international standards. It's not always clear what uh, are the best international standards, but I think very often they happen to come from the European Union. So I have in many contexts promoted European Union standards as standards which China can look into, they can never copy, but they can look into for development in China itself. And we are working on the value chains, we are working on the transport corridors, and we are working course, on the uh, energy issues to move from coal to solar. And there was an enormous excitement, I can tell you, in the Green Belt and Road Coalition uh, when President Xi made this statement that China will not stop all global coal financing. There are lots of speculations, particularly in negative Western media, about what, uh, what may be the Chinese motivation behind Belt and Road. I have a very simple view. I believe that Chinese reasons for moving into Belt and Road were more or less exactly the same as the American motives for launching the Marshall help to Europe after the Second World War. Basically, there are three reasons why China is doing this, in my view. Number one, to be a good global citizen, to do good for the world, the altruistic motive that you want to do well for others. And China has such a fantastic experience, as you alluded to, bringing every single Chinese out of extreme poverty, because China wants to use that expertise to help other countries to achieve some of the same. Secondly, of course, China wants a good name in the world, wants to relate to others, want to have power and influence, and want to learn from others in, in relationships. And to promote Chinese interest this way, Belt and Road is a good scheme, and that's natural. Every nation want, want to do the same. And thirdly, uh, Chinese business need markets, it needs technology, it needs raw materials. Uh, the big companies in China, the Alibaba or Tencent or Huawei or whoever, they can never thrive in isolation. That's why China is such a proponent for global trade. And Belt and Road is a way for China to link up economically to other parts of the world. But all these three reasons to go for Belt and Road, the altruistic motive, the power or political motive, and the economic motive, they come together in this scheme. And uh, it's the biggest driver of development in the world today, but we need to take it in a greener uh, di direction. Uh, it's well known. I mean, you, you, 
it's well known, I think, to everyone uh, that China is now the leader on green technologies. I cannot name one single environment technology where China is not in the lead. True, there may be niches where, say, Silicon Valley is ahead or where German industry is ahead, but overall, uh, to bring to a, a, a cost which people can afford the major instrument of the green transition, China is in the lead. Half of all solar energy in the world last year was uh, established in China. China is by far the biggest wind power nation. If you look to green hydrogen, they already established a green hydrogen exhibition center at the new Daqing airport in, uh, in Beijing. Uh, and in, in the Mongolia, there are huge, huge plans to use the desert areas there to put up wind power and to put up solar power. This is one of the most, one of the best areas in the world for solar power. And of course, in the Mongolia, you can then use this enormous uh, uh, amount of renewable energy to produce green hydrogen and take that to the rest of China and the world by, by rail shipping or, or, or by road. So um, uh, the renewable trans transition, China is well ahead of everyone else. I just visited last year Envision, that's the, one of the biggest wind farm companies in the world in the Jiangsu province and companies like that beautiful, well-functioning, well-operating, uh, great companies have a lot to offer to the rest of the world when, when it comes to the energy transition we are into. Exactly the same is the case when it comes to electric mobility. 40% of the global market for electric vehicles last year were in China. True, we Norwegians can, we can be proud because we have the higher per capita amount of electric vehicles here. We have the highest in the world. Last month, eight out of 10 cars sold in Norway uh, were electric, and we are very proud of that. But when it comes to the size of the market, China is far ahead of everyone else. Elon Musk, the captain of Tesla, just said that China is far ahead of the United States when it comes to uh, environment pro um, um, uh, policies. And he added that no nation is going aggressively into electric mobility in the way China is doing. And that's an American statement, so it cannot be seen as biased for them uh, for, an, for, an, for an, an, any purpose. But China has 70% of all high-speed rail. There are 40,000 kilometers of high-speed rail in China, all established after the Olympic in Beijing in 2008. That means China, uh, in the United States, there is not one single kilometer of high-speed rail, and China is moving far ahead of anyone else on this. Half of all metro constructions in the world has been by China in the last two decades, mainly in China itself, but more and more also in other parts of the world. And China is now contributing to the Laos Railroad, uh, to the Bandung, uh, Jakarta Railroad in Indonesia, and to, to many, many other projects in, uh, in green mobility. Here in Oslo, NIO, a Chinese electric car company, has now just have established an exhibition center in, in the, the main street. So, and of course, what we want to do in the Global Coalition for Green Belt and Road is to take all these Chinese technologies and investment and Chinese financial institutions who can underpin this to as many developing countries as possible. But in, if we can do it in partnership with European, with American, uh, Indian, other business, e even better. Because Belt and Road is not just about the relationship between China and uh, recipient countries, it should also involve a wider array of international business. What I think is maybe not as well known, particularly in the West, is that China is not only a lead nation on environment technology, but also now more and more a lead nation on environment practice. President Xi just promised that China will plant an area the size of Belgium every year from now to 20, to 2030. That's an enormous uh, ambition. And, but I'm sure it will happen because I myself watched, uh, observed the enormous tree planting areas like in Saihan Bai and Hebei province or the greening of the deserts in, in the Mongolia. Uh, even the American uh, space agency, NASA, uh, has said that tree planting, greening in China is the main factor driving the surface uh, of the planet green. While of course we have also exciting stories from Pakistan as we just heard and from other other parts, um, parts of, the, uh, of, of the world. Adding uh, President Xi after COVID has, I think, visited three or four different national parks in China. 
uh, to set out the need for the Chinese people to go for a beautiful China and the enormous aspiration and promise in such a, such a slogan. Uh, and uh, in his speech to the Kunming Conference on Nature or Biodiversity just recently, he launched a number of new national parks, among them the Giant, Chan, Giant Panda National Park in Sichuan, but also a, a good number of, uh, of others. And so here China is also kind of leading the world uh, in a green direction. The Chinese scheme of so-called uh, environment redlining is best practice now in the world to, to make a scientific uh, assessment of an, a green area in a, in a heavily populated area, like say the Lovi Yangtze or the Pearl River Delta, how to assess what areas you should conserve in an area where there are so many people living. And that's, uh, that's very, very promising. I mean, the rest of the world cannot copy it, but we can, we can uh, learn from it. And of course, when it comes to pollution, China has been very successful over the last decade. Uh, the impressions in the West, because still people are not really observing the change, is that uh, China is a heavily populated uh, place. But if you look to the, po the pollution, uh, sorry, he heavily polluted place, if you look to the pollution in Chinese cities, I have an app where you can compare pollution in Chinese in them, uh, European cities. On many occasions, the pollution in main Chinese cities are now at the level of Europe or sometimes even lower, because it's much, much lower than pollution in most of the developing uh, country uh, cities. So that's a huge, huge achievement. And it's not just uh, air, it's also water. Uh, I visited a few years back Shenyang province, where there have been fantastic progress in cleaning up some of the rivers. They were called milky rivers in the past, no, not because they were healthy like milk, but because they were so polluted, they were, they were just white. So if you add all these areas, technology, um, tree planting, pollution control, and I may also add urban development, China has now some of the most amazing green cities in the world, cities like Hangzhou or Suzhou, or maybe in particular Shenzhen. Shenzhen has some fantastic green corridors going through the city. These green corridors will help if there was a flooding or an environment catastrophe caused by climate change, they will help alleviate the pain. But there are also beautiful green areas where people can go for a walk or children can play. And indeed, the, uh, apartments uh, in, the, in the neighborhood of these green corridors are now the highest property prices in, in China, skyrocketing uh, property prices. And there's a wetland in Shenzhen, not, uh, all buses, all taxis are electric, and even many of the uh, trucks at the construction sites are now, now electric. So China has so much to show for itself in environment technology and environment practice, and Belt and Road is a fantastic opportunity to share this with the world, but for sure also for China to learn. Europe has many fantastic green cities, Copenhagen, Stockholm, Amsterdam, Singapore is a very beautiful and green city. And of course there are technologies and practice from the rest of the world, which also can inform uh, developments in China. But that is what Belt and Road is all about, to make this happen. Finally, uh, if we look to the negatives, uh, we, I think we, ha we have, the, for the first time in human history, the enormous opportunity, as indicated, for the win-win policies. There is no longer a choice between development and environment. That was the case in the 20th century. But now we have all the win-win policies, renewable energy, electric mobility, green agriculture, green tourism, uh, the circular economy, and we need to pursue those. Uh, we need to, for that to happen to make the transition fair because if it's not fair, we will cause a lot of resistance. In the United States, there are five times more jobs in the solar energy than in coal. But if you're a coal worker in Kentucky, you may not be happy just to see uh, people getting jobs in the solar industry in Arizona or California. And of course, in China, you will have lots of the same mechanism. Coal workers in Shanxi may not be excited to see windmills or solar in Guangdong or, or Fujian or the fantastic uh, tech, high-tech industry in, in Shenzhen or Hangzhou. So you need to make the policies fair and the transition fair. And here I think European Union has some of the most developed policies which we all should look into. And finally, we need to work together 
because if I allow the idea of decoupling or the idea of a new Cold War to take root, we will fail. In the oldest of the Indian texts, the Vedas, there is a text saying, the whole world is one family. That should be our, uh, our aim. We need to bring together everyone, particularly the United States and China need to work together, but as well Europe, uh, India, Latin America, everyone else, if we work together, we can achieve absolutely everything. If I love someone to split us, we will fail. John Bolton, who was the American security advisor during Trump's time, he once asked the African continent to choose. He said, either you are with us, with America, or you are with China. Not one African leader raised his hand, not one, because no one wants that choice. Every African leader, but that applies to every Asian leader, every Latin American leader, every European leader. We don't want to choose. We want to be very, very close to, the, to America and China at the same time. We can have friends, we can have trade, we can act politically with both China and the United States. So let the rest of us stand up against this process or this idea of decoupling of a cold, or a Cold War, because it will make it much more difficult to whatever we want to achieve. Pandemic response, development, trade, environment, peace, everything which is there to the people on this earth, we can achieve together. Then we should act as the, if the whole world is one family. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Erik Solheim, who I should also mention was the Minister of Environment in Norway as a political leader. Uh, Perhaps one of his colleagues, uh, uh, who was also has been a member of parliament and has been a friend of the uh, Belt and Road Institute in Sweden, has been uh, the former parliamentarian, Mr. Tura Vespi. Uh, so <clears throat> we're very happy to have uh, your input on this matter, especially from the Norwegian faction. Uh, <clears throat> I also want to mention that. <clears throat> Mr. Solheim has worked very much in India, as he referenced in some of his remarks. Uh, and I think this is would be a major factor in promoting uh, the objective of cooperation and what one can also refer to as economic cooperation in the name of uh, world peace. <clears throat> and that would be to, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, to have uh, India uh, participate uh, directly in the Belt and Road if some of these uh, uh, <clears throat> issues which I think stand in the way can be eliminated. That would be a tremendous step uh, to also, also further the uh, improvement and expansion of the uh, concept of global development through the BRI. Uh, <clears throat> I will mention one uh, thing which I think on the, the note of uh, <clears throat> uh, what is happening on some of these questions in Scandinavia is a, re <clears throat> a very interesting development, which I was informed of yesterday, a speech by the uh, former uh, amb ambassador of, uh, from Denmark to China, Mr. Arne Pet uh, Fries Arne Peterson, uh, gave a presentation on is the Belt and Road Initiative geoeconomics or geopolitics? Uh, and he says in his remarks yesterday, this was at the, uh, the Danish uh, 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 Institute for International Studies, <clears throat> uh, which is the leading foreign policy think tank that is allied with the Danish foreign ministry. And he said, we are not concentrating enough on how China created their successful economic development. Why is infrastructure so important in China, both inside and outside the country? And he mentioned the need that China felt to develop the uh, AI, AIIB, the uh, International Infrastructure Bank uh, as a, alternative to the IMF and the World Bank, 
because there is not enough development that is coming from the West. If there had been <clears throat> a type of, <clears throat> of orientation which represented what Mr. Solheim referred to as the Marshall Plan it coming from the West in the present period, I believe that the United States and other allies would join hands with China in order to promote the kind of global development that we are uh, encouraging. So I think that's a very positive move that uh, we are now perhaps going to hear more about that Denmark uh, has a leading former ambassador. Also, he was the ambassador to the United States as well as China from Denmark uh, at an earlier period, uh, emphasizing that the Belt and Road is not something to, th to, to as a threat, but is a, uh, a, 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 a basis for cooperation where it, it is in our interest to shake hands. Uh, <clears throat> so with that said, uh, and with the next speaker, uh, I would like to introduce uh, the uh, Mr. Professor Michele uh, Gerace, who, uh, 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 who has been with us before, uh, on a number of occasions. He is uh, the former Undersecretary of the State of, of uh, Undersecretary of State at the Italian Ministry of Economic Development, which is was or had been, has been responsible for international trade and foreign direct investments. He is an expert in Chinese economics, and he is fluent in the Chinese language. In, He'll be speaking to us from China, and uh, I welcome you, Professor Gerace, to uh, give us some insights as to how, from your perspective, we can further this type of uh, development around uh, the Belt and Road, and specifically the Green Belt and Road. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for the for the invitation. Happy to be here again. Stortak für Imbuden. I hope I pronounce it correctly. <laughs> and yes. what uh, and greetings to all of you from uh, from China. Um, my uh, view and what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes is a little bit, uh, uh, let's say, geopolitical view. And then I want to show you some uh, some data because I think it's important to also talk about uh, uh, numbers. Uh, from the geopolitical uh, uh, point of view, I've been uh, arguing for the last uh, couple of years that uh, green uh, is uh, now what uh, the development uh, of uh, open market economies was uh, at the end of the 1970s. We now have both a economic and political convergence of benefits from both the United States that is joining again the climate change talks from the from Europe, generally speaking, that is you know pushing for a development in the green arena. The European Union is doing it. Non-EU countries have done it already. So that's also the push from the part of Europe. And in China, we have President Xi Jinping committing to carbon neutrality in 26 already in Davos a couple of years ago. And this reminds me of when in 1970s, 80s, we had both in the US, in Europe, and in China, a move towards market economy. We had Ronald Reagan in the United States, Margaret Thatcher, in the UK and uh, Deng Xiaoping in uh, China, all of three at the same time, uh, this, you know, understanding that there was the political will and the economic advantage uh, to make change. And I do think now on the green, we do have uh, the same convergence of both economic and political uh, will. Uh, I uh, should also mention that I'm working closely with uh, my former professor of MIT, Professor John Sturman, uh, in the Climate uh, Initiative in Boston, and uh, uh, developing a model of climate change that uh, does suggest that uh, 
uh, going green does uh, not cost, but it saves money, around $200 trillion by the end of the century, because using a model, uh, we use the uh, Stern Deeds curve, if we do not uh, uh, maintain the temperature uh, below two degrees, well below two degrees, uh, it costs us. It costs us in terms of social unrest, uh, potential uncontrolled uh, migration, cities uh, both like Venice uh, and Shanghai potentially underwater. So there are indeed economic costs. It is not something that we must do it because it's nice to save the world. We want to do it because we, it makes us money. And I'm always uh, uh, the guy that thinks that we need to go for the bottom, double bottom approach. Uh, the, let's say, good, uh, do the right things, the good things, uh, but also try to make money. Otherwise, just working on, let's say, charity, uh, the, we, we easily run out, out of fuel, to be honest, we, we, we have to say that. But luckily, climate now is a business. And so there is money to be made. Now, I want to show you uh, the debate that we have had in the last few uh, weeks, and even uh, uh, from Glasgow, from the COP26, uh, to, to look at really, you know, who is responsible, who should take the responsibility, how do we, the West, uh, interact uh, with uh, China? And I do know that, uh, unfortunately, we do not understand each other. Uh, we do, I just saw uh, Charles Michel just now in uh, Brussels, uh, making a statement about uh, the investment agreement with China, the CIA, that is uh, in a way a child of the Belt and Road. Uh, it is a, a, you know, a step forward on how European countries and China could actually cooperate to have a reciprocity in each, in each other's market. But as often, uh, without really knowing too much about it, uh, he and other politicians have fallen again into the trap to bring uh, politics and geopolitics in the territory of economy. So rather than discussing the things that China needs to fix, which is market access, reciprocity, some transparencies in investment that we all want, and China does need to have the time to do it, and China knows that they are behind, uh, the European Union, uh, and I will send you the short message that Michel wrote to today, it, you know, it brings back the Xinjiang, the Hong Kong, the Taiwan, uh, the human rights, as if, as if uh, we, Europe, have nothing to be forgiven about. Uh, it's funny that he mentioned this in Brasso, that is the capital of Belgium, that probably has a, a history in Africa that uh, never is brought up by our Chinese friends. The Chinese friends do not go to Brasso, do not go to Rome and talk about the human rights problem that we have in Italy, human rights problem that we have in other countries. Uh, we do not, they do not talk about Catalonia, they do not talk about Sardinia, they do not talk about uh, uh, why Czechoslovakia split, you know, everyone does what they want. Uh, so it, there's a little bit of uh, uh, try to always bring uh, politics uh, into the territory of economy. And from my experience, uh, I know that this uh, uh, is a recipe disaster. So my, uh, I really advocate to separate those issues and uh, keep them really separate. Now, on the numbers, I may just share a screen with uh, uh, maybe, I think you see now. Not yet. So this is uh, yeah. what people always talk about. So this is uh, emission of CO2 over the last, uh, you know, 200 years uh, with China overcome, over surpassing the United States. And now, China blamed because it emits 10.5 billions of CO2 per year. And so people say, well, China is the culprit of all this temperature increase. So you see the red line. But in this graph, and I hope it's visible, we also show the area. So the area, the integral of the curve is really the effect, the cumulative effect of CO2 over time. And we don't need to go back to 1751, and we don't even care because there was no CO2 emission. But if we just look at the last 50 years, uh, because CO2 remains in the atmosphere for decades, uh, it's not clear if it's 20, 30, 50, or 100 years. So let's take 50 years. So uh, CO2 stock uh, that is responsible for uh, temperature rise is the stock from 1950. And so if we look at the area, 
that is here in uh, below the green line, that of the United States, uh, and then the red one, which is Russia and the UK and India growing, we do see that uh, while China is the highest emitter today, if we measure by flow of the year, it is not by cumulative. And then we look at what has really happened, and I show you really the 1950 to 19 chart, where China is responsible for 16% of total cumulative emission, US 23, Europe, uh, we have, uh, I put them all together, of course, uh, 30% uh, between the EU, UK, Russia, and others. So we kind of, sh let's, you know, Europe and United States, 30 and, and US 23, the rest of America up to 27. So let's say the West, almost uh, two thirds, if we include uh, uh, Japan, Korea, Australia, and other, let's say, uh, Asian European countries. And China, 16%. So China says, well, you know, guys, uh, yes, so we emit more than anyone else, but it is not the, our 10.5 billion tons per year that uh, causes the problem. It is the stock. And then if we look on a per capita basis, uh, which brings uh, the idea of the right of every citizen, should a Chinese uh, citizen have uh, equal right uh, to pollute and clean up uh, than the average uh, American? Uh, should uh, we uh, blame China for developing late and say, well, guys, it's your problem. We developed in the 50s, 60s. You wasted 30 years before you opened up in 78. So I'm sorry. Yes, we polluted more, but uh, you could have done uh, like other countries to develop uh, first. Uh, and the size uh, is important because that goes to uh, the thing that we in the West have as a primary objective, the right of the individual. So it's very interesting that we blame China for being an aggregate polluter, but we do, because we have the Enlightenment and the French Revolution and all these things, we put the individual first, China puts the society first, but then we say, oh, no, no, it doesn't matter. When it comes to pollution, it is not the individual that matter, it is the aggregate. So let's go back and blame China again. So this story really goes back and forth and we do not come out of it. And I am very, uh, not very optimistic of what I hear in uh, uh, Glasgow. One last point that uh, we should uh, also take into account is that uh, while countries produce uh, uh, CO2, uh, in many cases, they do produce it for consumption of other countries. Uh, so a uh, gas that is uh, uh, extracted uh, in uh, northern Russia and does pollute a little bit uh, in the, the way and when it is extracted, it then gets transferred and burned maybe in other countries like in Italy, we import gas uh, from uh, Russia. Uh, if China has a power plant uh, in uh, Vietnam, uh, and they stop the production of new uh, coal plants in Vietnam, in uh, Kenya. Uh, it is uh, Kenya and Vietnam that get the credit for lower emission, but it is in a way China that is the agent for that. So my advice really is on all these issue of climate change, otherwise we really never uh, solve it, is uh, try to uh, do not do finger pointing. Um, we may not want to say too much of whose fault is it, whose fault it is now. So we can forget about the graph that I, sh I just sh sh showed you. It doesn't matter who pollutes most now and who has polluted most, but we need to find a way to give, uh, I think emerging market, and I'm talking here about China, I'm extending to my Belt and Road world, which is all of Asia, all of Africa. We have uh, 6 billion people that they need to have uh, a chance to economic uh, development. Uh, and uh, so I think it's responsibility of the more rich countries in the West to, instead of finger pointing, find ways to allow those countries, especially Africa and countries of Central Asia, to have the development maybe by transferring technology, maybe by allowing even uh, Chinese made solar panel, wind, that we have complained that China does dumping, so be it. Dumping is good to give cheap uh, means of production of electricity to those countries and therefore make them uh, more competitive vis-a-vis -vis coal. Otherwise, we will have Africa, India, and other countries to pollute in a way that uh, will, of course, uh, make China look uh, green.
let's look at the net effect. Uh, China will continue to emit coal for the next 10 years, but it also does things uh, to compensate. And uh, the zero carbon neutrality is not a zero gross, it's impossible, it's a zero net. So countries can continue to emit a little bit, and I don't like it, they should cut it to zero, but that's impossible. But they have compensating mechanisms with trees, with the electrification of some uh, parts of the economy, with some capture, and by also doing things that uh, are positive in uh, outside their own country, for which they do not uh, get the credit. So cooperation, cooperation, cooperation. Stephen, talk. Talk to make a shame. I want to uh, to make uh, before I introduce our next uh, panelist just a few remarks. Which, uh, being the vice uh, vice chairman of the Belt and Road Institute, uh, are probably a bit controversial, but uh, I think need to be mentioned in light of the topic, which is uh, China. Uh, although they are as I think the speakers have uh, outlined quite, uh, quite nicely uh, from uh, Mr. Solheim and uh, Professor uh, Giraci that uh, China is very actively promoting and developing nuclear power. Uh, it is not stopping uh, nuclear power, which is not a, uh, 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 a, a factor of releasing uh, a carbon dioxide. Uh, it is, from that standpoint, a clean form of energy, but it is a highly productive form of energy. And China is not alone actively pursuing this as a form of technological development. They have, at the moment, 49 uh, fusion plants which are operating, and they are working to develop these. Uh, in Argentina or helping 11 countries, Argentina, South Africa, Kenya, Sudan, uh, Armenia, and Egypt. <clears throat> I think that <clears throat> it's important <clears throat> in light of the question of development that one also understands that productivity in economic factors is a highly relevant and important factor in promoting growth and economic growth. And the remarks by Professor uh, Girace that economic uh, cooperation is a foundation for uh, allowing the, the uh, basis for uh, uh, a more suitable environment for, uh, for nations to work together. Uh, they are also, and I mentioned this on uh, just briefly, but China's uh, it very advanced uh, uh, space program, which is uh, landed on the far side of the moon, is also researching and developing the possibility of getting helium-3, which is a uh, form of helium that is very suitable for fusion reactions and is not present because of the Earth's atmosphere that blocks the uh, uh, produ production of helium-3 on the planet Earth, which is quite small, <clears throat> but it is quite large on the moon. And the prospects of utilizing fusion, which uh, there is a, a, a very advanced uh, engineering, tokamak engineering project at the Chinese Institute of Plasma Physics, which is under operation and uh, working very rapidly to develop the means of uh, promoting and making commercial fusion energy uh, available for mankind, which if that would become in the prospective future a possibility, we're talking about a virtually unlimited source of power for uh, the, and with that being the case, I wanted to introduce our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Mr. Henry Tillman and the founder of the chair and, and chairman of China Investment Research. Uh, and he will present some hope, <clears throat> some details of the work that he is involved in that I think will be 
highly useful for uh, for our discussion. So, Mr. Tillman. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen and, and all. Um, first of all, thanks to everyone for some fantastic presentations. Um, I live in this every day and I still learned a great deal from what I've heard the last, the last hour and a half. So thank you, number one. Number two is uh, what I talk about fortunately links into everything you've said. So we're, we're aligned fortunately before I launch into a deck, um, all of which is positive. So let me just go into a deck quickly. Let's see. One second. Um, just launch these. Sorry. I've lost ability to. Uh, we see. We see the uh, first uh, slide there. No, I know. I'm. I'm having trouble finding the. Uh, just a second. If the start. On this thing, I have home. The uh, top left, uh, there's a sign up for the slideshow. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm looking for the slideshow on the top left, but I don't see it, my friend. Oh, I see. It. I have new slide. Um, <laughs> maybe I just go like this. Worst case, because I'm worried about time. Hussein, basically. Um, so I, I apologize if this that's exactly the way you want to see it, but I, I think you'll be just fine. So basically, uh, what this talks about is what's happened to date and where it goes from 2030 onwards. So I don't want to go over materials you guys have already covered. And we look at three different components of this. One is Arctic LNG, which we consider a transition, uh, transitional fuel, much lower in CO2, while the EU doesn't think that way. Certainly China and India think this way. Electric high-speed rail, we show the progress made to date, and MSR molten salt reactors we talk a piece of this we don't want to go fully into nuclear today because there's not an adequate time but we certainly want to talk about msr so we did this just a few weeks ago in uh in iceland and what this basically shows is is um, um, um people believe that china is driving under the polar silk road this initiative for for um, L Ar Arctic LNG. In fact, it's really being led by Russia um, because Russia controls as 60% of the population of the Arctic, 33% of the land mass. But beginning in 2002, Russia began uh, attracting, um, developing this and attracted uh, the first investment from Japan in 2009, attracted investment from France commencing in 2011, uh, investment from China in 2014, uh, po post sanctions attracted Japan, uh, Japan and Korea, uh, Korea in 15, Japan in 17, India in 21, and UAE in 21. So look how this has grown in the last several years. So it now includes uh, seven different countries. Uh, what we thought originally was going to go west to Zabrugi and, and north into uh, um, uh, northern uh, Kirkenes did not go that direction. It went much further east and south. Here are, um, here are on the left-hand side shows how it's been developing and on the right-hand side, how it should be developing in the next couple of years. Short form is there was nothing before, 12, I think it was 16 million, 11 million in 2016. And by 2024, it is expected to be 80 million tons of liquid uh, of LNG, basically, uh, and at 80 million tons by by 2024. To, to remind all that Qatar is only at 77 million tons right now. So, if uh, and Novacek is pretty clear that they can get to 80 million tons by 2024, which is why Qatar's launched um, four more ships to be built by China uh, to uh, to actually increase their their production uh, in, in, con in conjunction with uh, Russia, which could go much higher than 80 million tons going forward. So high growth and is now is attracting attention from, from the South in, in, the, in the Gulf. This is one of the reasons why it's growing so fast. If you look at the line at the bottom, it's much cheaper. Yes, and then West. So Russia could produce it much fast, much cheaper. It doesn't involve the shipping costs the shipping is actually done 
uh, across the northern sea route, which we'll talk about in a second, and it's protected. It's it's a new shipping line, and to pick up the, the messages from the prior speakers, this is a shipping lane that people are wanting to protect relative to making it green, i.e. carbon capture is now being discussed with Japan and Russia, for example. So again, the price difference is huge, which then leads to usage. This is expected usage. When it was in 2016, it was virtually all going to Asia by 20, I think it was by 2020, 50% of Russian LNG was going to uh, Europe. But you see going forward, 88% of this will be um, re le really leading to uh, China. By, I think China by 2030 is supposed to be the leading player and India not far behind, which I'll show you in just a second. Uh, and you see the, the growth in LNG in, in terms of shipping, cargo volumes, again, as the ice melts. Yes, uh, this will show you, um, hopefully, uh, the reason for that, uh, which is basically it, 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 it goes west to Murmansk, east to uh, around the, the top, and of course down to Chem Kamchatka, where it could then be distributed to uh, major users of Korea, uh, Japan, China, etc. The, the ships on the bottom show the various different uh, uplifts capabilities in shipping. We don't have time to do that today because we have other things to cover, but uh, I think it's fair with the ice melting, the way it's melting, and the fact that Russia now has five sub nuclear subs that actually have um, 2.3 meter ice breaking capabilities and five more being built, which have four meter ice breaking capabilities around. Moving quickly. Uh, this slide shows uh, India, and again, I'm sorry about the, I can't seem to find them. Um, I can't see them. If you were to look just to say to the right, you'll see that in, in September, you'll see that Modi met at, uh, with, with Putin and talked about how they could build upon their partnerships in space, leading to energy, um, where um, there are discussions about buying it, the other 9.9% in the Arctic LNG2 LNG project which is having trouble being financed because the EU doesn't rec rec recognize this as an, as an alternative fuel, number one. And number two, they really don't want e EU banks lending into this, which was actually has led Russia and Putin to recap, restructure one of these uh, projects to actually go into ammonia for Japan to invest in. So they're not investing uh, in ammonia. Uh, Henry, not Mr. Henry, we are losing your audio for some reason. Sorry, okay. hello. Your yeah. audio yes. has a little, was a little broken. Sorry. Okay. This, maybe this clears it's the good now. That's better. Good now. Yeah. I think we should also get the slides back. Sorry. This is better here. So on the right-hand side, you see that, that basically that uh, India is thinking about investing 10% into this giant 21 billion project. And you also see the right-hand side of where... Um, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Hello, I don't know what happened. I tried to share again. Thank you. I'm working on it. I don't know what's happened to it. Huh, I've lost it. Let me just continue the discussion. So basically I could cover the slides, the rest of it. You've seen the, the text. What I want to cover is what you heard before, which is basically, uh, um, basically that bas the, the rail service across Europe has gone from 17 rails from, uh, from uh, 2011 from China into Europe. This year in 2021, it'll be 20,000. And basically within 20,000, you actually have reached a limit in Xinjiang. So, um, so you need to look at other, other routes, which is why you're talking about the routes that go through, um, through Ukraine south into Slovakia. Yes, and, uh, and, and, and then also to the north um, from, from Greece and Turkey up. The next slide would have shown you basically that there's a second route uh, rather than just through Moscow that loops down through Poland. There's a second route called BTK, which goes through um, the center, the Caspians, and then it links into Turkey and then up. So Turkey becomes a key component of this. 
the next slide would be was just us really to say that um, it links into what we heard before, which is um, the the high speed rail from Laos is is become it becomes functional next month. Uh, Indonesian high speed rail becomes functional next month. Um, the, there's already links between Vietnam and China, and there's also links between Myanmar and China. And I also mentioned to our friends in Pakistan, the M1 will be functional by 2026. Once the M1 is functional, it then links to Tehran, and that could be the high-speed rail that links it into, if you will, into to Turkey and into Greece. From that point north, you could then see, uh, you're already down to seven days. You can see a crossing in four days within the, within by 20. By 2030, and again, you heard before this is electric, so it's again uh, it costs savings. The last piece I just talked through is what you heard from Stephen as as a lead, which is the EU is focusing on trying to clean up the uh, the emissions from the shipping industry. If the shipping industry were a country, it would be um, it would be the sixth largest polluter as a country. So they've ordered to clean up the emissions by 2050. Um, but that's been going very slowly in terms of cleaning it up. They're looking at their various different options, which are uh, hydrogen and methane, obviously with Maersk, but MSR could be much better. So the history of MSR, as you heard from Stephen, uh, th these were, this was used in submarines back since 1955 and MSR since 1969. The USR actually had, the USA had an MSR plant that was functional in, in, in 1969. And a container ship that used it for eight years called the Savannah, but you couldn't weaponize it. And since it was isn't able to weaponize, uh, the U.S. never developed it. So develop so beginning in 2011, China began working with Japan to develop this nuclear power led by thorium. So, so again, this is not an explosive capability. There's plenty of thorium um, in, uh, in many countries, including uh, China and in Norway. And the thorium and China began began um, testing the thorium reactor as recently as September. There are a number of ways to make sure this um, gets cleared from, if you will, social issues. You have to clear IMO. You have to clear Lloyd's Register. Um, but already, uh, Russia, China have already cleared submarines and icebreakers. Japan and Korea have cleared MSR. We see them being testing in 2023 and commercialized by 2028. There actually is a commercial vehicle already doing this, which is called Core Power UK in the UK. It launched its first fund in Singapore in 2019. It is partnered with uh, Terra Power and Southern Power in the US. Terra Power is chaired by Bill Gates. I'm pretty sure Mr. Gates was over here talking to uh, Boris Johnson about financing this. So they've raised both uh, rounds of capital so far, and they've also raised investors from major shipping companies. So. It's, it's early days yet, but it, it does exist and it's been financed here so far. So and with, again, with a launch date of 2023 and functional by 2028, how does this change the world? Basically, it changed the world because basically <laughs> 60,000, there are 60,000 container ships in the world. 7,000 of those produce 50% of the emissions. And so once this is built and functional, you won't need these ships to use fuel oil anymore. It'll increase the speeds of the ships. It gives more internal storage capability. And it's certainly doable. And why do I know of this? Because basically, I've been involved with a number of these governments trying to buy this technology or work on this technology in the last three weeks, and I've seen real demand for it. Um, are there issues with this? Sure. The answer is it still has to be done on a massive basis. And secondly, there'll be issues with canals, both in Suez and Panama. And it will also take time to train in the um, staff training to implement it fully. So, so in short, by 2030, we see continued use of LNG as a, as a bridge fuel away from coal, both with China and with India. We see continued use of high-speed rail. Russian rail is already working on um, flat cars that go 400 kilometers per hour. And we see the development of MSR. And Stephen, as you said, there's also other medium-sized nuclear fuels that need to be, are also being developed. But it's MSR, particularly for shipping, will, will be transformational. So I apologize for the slides. I don't know what happened, but I hope I at least got the message through that these are three issues, which these are three developments which are in the process of happening. They're not just theoretical. And it's interesting to me, the three countries, four countries that didn't go to COP were China, Russia, and Turkey. And you can see these are integral of what we're talking about here. All three, all three countries are integral, especially Turkey with both of those 
connectivities, um, both the mid middle route and the southern route on the high-speed rail. So thank you for your time. Apologies for the slides. Okay, uh, that was very enlightening, Mr. Tillman. I am sure that uh, there are some points there that uh, will be uh, resonating around uh, the world on what the uh, relevance of this for development could be also for the EU and uh, even the uh, United States, as you mentioned. Uh, your PowerPoint, I think there were some uh, remarks asking if it's possible to get access to that. I don't know if you could make that available in some other way, but uh, there was definitely a uh, big interest to uh, capture some of the uh, information that you had there. I just mentioned that to you. Uh, it's, the least, it's the least I could do, Stephen, because I don't know what happened to my machine. That never happens, but I'm more, I'm more than happy to share the slides with you and you can then pass them out. And you and Hussein, you guys didn't pass them out accordingly because this is important information for people to have and I'm more than happy to share it. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> our next speaker I would like to introduce is uh, Mr. Georg Finsrud. He is also Norwegian. We have a big Norwegian delegation. <clears throat> so we're very happy for that. Uh, and uh, I hope we can get some of our Swedish colleagues to jump on board uh, together with some of the others in Denmark and uh, expand the dynamic uh, in the coming year. I think it's uh, this kind of platform is extremely important for that. Uh, in that light, uh, Mr. Uh, Finsrud is the uh, technical head of a company called Scanwater uh, Technology. And he is also going to give us an overview of uh, SIEU Green, which is an EU-China cooperation uh, project that he is affiliated with. I believe also Mr. Tora Vespi is. Uh, and I think uh, I would like to offer you the, uh, the time now to present uh, some of the uh, relevant information that you are working with. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stephen, and thank you to uh, to uh, the brief breaks, and especially thank you also to uh, to Tore Vespi for uh, inviting me to uh, to give a presentation here. I uh, feel very honored to do that uh, uh, among the panelists. Um, uh, I am an engineer. I uh, actually graduated from uh, Chalmers University of Technology uh, within Water and Environment in, uh, in Gothenburg. Uh, and I would like to, um, to share my screen to uh, brief you to my presentation. Is it okay, moderator? Yes, we see. Yep. Uh, just very, very briefly, uh, Scanwater is a Norwegian company. We, uh, uh, we deal uh, with um, uh, giving, uh, uh, pretending water solutions to, um, uh, to uh, human aid uh, and, uh, and uh, preparedness uh, situations. And it can look a little bit like this if you look at a field hospital, which has been quite... Um, uh, uh, a new situation when you go around the world, uh, you can see that um, uh, the use of mobile water systems, mobile uh, treatment systems for uh, black water and shower water and to make it safe in any city, uh, the pandemic has uh, showed up that, that this actually is a need. And uh, uh, in Norway, we had a, we actually had a, uh, the government uh, had a focus on preparedness uh, last week. And uh, when I'm out uh, working with, for example, New Wigan municipalities, I, I usually ask uh, if, if they know how much water the government actually says that we should have in our basement in, in case of a disaster or a need of an emergency. I'm not sure if you know that, but uh, definitely many of the technicians in Norwegian municipalities don't know that. And the suggestion is that we have nine liter per person a day. So now, you, so now you know that, and, and scenarios for when, for when actually we, uh, we should be prepared are, I feel, getting closer and closer to us. Um, this is just an example of some of our, uh, our 
customers. Um, so uh, and uh, the pandemic also showed us that uh, now uh, municipalities in European cities definitely also are customers uh, for a water and safe water and sanitation systems. I want to speak now about a quite remarkable and nice uh, project, uh, the SIEU Green. It's a, it's a, a project that uh, holds uh, participants from many European countries, Sweden, Denmark, Italy, Turkey, and of course, uh, China. And uh, it addresses uh, renewable energy, uh, green tech planting, urban agriculture, social innovations. And what I am going to talk most about is uh, blue tech water and water management. And uh, just why are scan water uh, involved in this project? That is mainly because we we have a long history working together with the, the University of Life Science. And <clears throat> it started actually in 1995, where a, a Chinese a PhD student from that university moved back to China, started working uh, as a professor at a university in the province um, Hunan in, in Changsha, capital city. And uh, a lot developed. Uh, through his engagement. We had projects where we exported Norwegian technology to China to show how, to, how we clean water and drinking water and wastewater. And uh, keep in mind, this is now more than um, uh, 20 years ago. And uh, uh, we have ever since used uh, Norwegian tools to bridge uh, engineering capacity for us between the uh, between Norway and China and we have a lot of uh, common understanding today on, on how we do things and now uh, we export a lot of technology from China so um, um, it has uh, been um, uh, a really interesting uh, history to look back on and having that uh, quite uh, good relations with the, with China makes uh, Scanwater an uh, um, uh, uh, interesting partner in the, in the CU Green project. So it has showcases in uh, a small city in Norway called Fredrikstad and a quite large city in China, Shangsha. Uh, what I will focus on is uh, a concept that we have uh, branded that is source separating technology on water and uh, zero waste on that. So we should definitely avoid mixing uh, excreta into the water cycle, but that, that de definitely happens more and more. The, the, the weather forecasts and the climate changes. And I think um, uh, the professor mentioned the uh, CO2 emissions and showed us um, a um, uh, um, sketch where we, where we were looking at uh, different sectors and the water sectors are definitely among the biggest contributors on CO2 emissions in, in every country. We pump water over enormously uh, large uh, uh, areas and, and that is the way we have done it. Um, I'm not sure, but in, in Norway, we have uh, uh, a need to repair old existing water and uh, sanitation infrastructure. And we have said that the cost to do that is around uh, 33 billion euro. That is actually 6,000 euro per capita in Norway to do that. And should we, should, should we continue to do it the same way that we have always done? In Norway, uh, around 30 to 50 percent of the drinking water actually leaks out before it reaches taps. I guess it does in many countries. Can we do this differently? Can we make it safer? Can we, can we actually uh, use uh, technology to extract uh, nutrients uh, from the water closer to us? And then also encouraging on urban agriculture. Uh, 
it can look like this. This is a very, very simple sketch, but it shows that we can separate the water streams in any building and in any uh, modern city. Uh, we do tests now at the university to, to show that we are tech ready to take out clean fertilizer products from the black water and from the organic uh, household uh, waste. And that, it, that creates huge advantages. I uh, remember from um, years ago when uh, Professor Peter Jensen at uh, the university said that one of the greatest uh, threats is that we will run out of uh, phosphate in the world. So we have, uh, uh, we have to do it differently in order to extract uh, organic phosphorus nitrogen and kalium from, uh, from our uses. And uh, today, some of these uh, products are clean out from medicine, medicine residuals and ready to use. So uh, here I see uh, huge opportunities and also huge uh, opportunities to create new businesses. Uh, we do the same uh, on treatment uh, and recycling of gray water. And this is just an example of a plant in Changsha in China, where, where this is uh, built into a basement of a 15-story house, where gray water is recycled for toilet flushing use. Here is uh, the professor showing uh, recycled and treated gray water onto drinking water quality. We don't necessarily need to treat it onto drinking water quality, but it can be treated onto quality that it makes it safe uh, to water plants and green fields. And that should be a, a, a limited target. And this source separation technology, I just want to, to, to mention it. We have branded it uh, Green Energy, and it has uh, created um, quite a lot of attention and it has also scored uh, quite high on the uh, EU's innovation radar. And uh, it makes us uh, quite, uh, quite proud. And we are, we are working a lot uh, now together with different stakeholders to actually market this way of doing, uh, uh, doing water investments in modern cities. I think this has a huge potential. You can imagine if cities can do it a little bit different, it will take off stress and load also on existing infrastructure, and it will keep, keep the, the cost uh, limited on uh, uh, actually developing the already existing and old sewage treatment plants. Here I also want to share with you some of the pictures from um, the showcases in Shangsha, and you can see how enormously beautiful it looks green balconies and um, they, they do a lot more, I can tell you, than uh, what we do in, uh, in Norway. And uh, there is a huge interest in this, uh, in this type of, uh, of projects. <clears throat> I also uh, show a new picture of a modern city. This, this was actually from a Norwegian newspaper uh, one week ago where they, where they um, highlighted uh, how a modern city would look in 2050. And uh, I was quite surprised uh, to see how much water actually were mentioned in this article by a journalist. Here you can see the urban farmer, uh, and uh, here are places for recycling gray water to flush toilets and use in all, uh, in all these uh, different buildings. It's very, very green and uh, the smell should be nice. And there are also biocarbon products here to keep heavy rainfalls away from streets and uh, tear it in the, the infrastructure. This was, uh, <clears throat> this was a very, uh, very, very quick introduction uh, from me to, uh, uh, to this CU Green project. And you can find a lot more information uh, on the project on uh, cogreen.eu, and it's it's really really interesting. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, to quickly present uh, here today. 
Okay, well, thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. Finsrud. I'm grateful for both uh, your input, which shows, as well as, uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Solheim and, uh, and Mr. Tillman and also Professor uh, Gerace that there is, uh, when one decides to, uh, to work together for technological uh, cooperation that uh, it works. People don't uh, see themselves as fighting or threatening one another, quite the opposite. When you're up in space, you work together. You're human beings who see the purpose of cooperation. And I think that's uh, a primary motive for how we can spread that type of thinking uh, globally. And it's very encouraging that there are these projects from Mr. Finsrud and Jürich Solheim for bringing the EU together uh, on these projects with China so that uh, more and more people can see these objective opportunities. Uh, so now I think we will have a question and answer period. Uh, it's a bit, we had thought perhaps we would end this first session at 12, but uh, the speakers in the second session will be only uh, Mr. Askari and myself. Uh, and I think we can begin that uh, uh, a, a bit later, uh, not at necessarily at uh, half past one, but I mean, half past 12, but we might shoot it up. But let's uh, have a quick Q&A period now where the panelists can respond and we'll see how much time we need for that and go forward. So Mr. Askari, do you have uh, some questions? Uh, there was a question to Mr. Eric Sulheim. Uh, did you get it on your screen? No. Okay. Uh, I have to go back to it. Question from Mr. Alf Johansson. Uh, he says, Mr. Solheim, what in your opinion is the reason why Scandinavia is so little involved in the BRI and what can be done about this? <clears throat> I have no very firm opinion on that. I think it's largely because um, uh, Scandinavian companies have been focusing on the bilateral relations to China, investment opportunities in China and business partnership with China and not really seen any opportunities to involve with, with, with Belt and Road, which is of course largely about the relationship between uh, China and, and developing countries. Um, so Belt and Road is also with a number of European countries. So it, it's not confined to development countries, but the main investments still are in places like Pakistan, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, and of course a, lot, a huge number of, uh, of African countries. So may, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a perception that it's not too much to begin for Scandinavian companies to involve in this. I think there is a need for more information. Uh, unfortunately, most information about China and in the mainstream media in Scandinavia is very negative. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable because it's uh, ignorance and arrogance combined. Um, and uh, we need to speak out um, to create a better understanding of China also. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Tillman, you raised your hand. Do you want to say something? Yes, I'd like to say something to pick up with what Eric was just saying. Eric, I think this is it's broader in healthcare because if you look if you look around the world, it's it really is a global effort in healthcare, whether it's the BRI vaccine hubs, but actually it's really a technology from the West that helped build those vaccine uh, those, those biotech companies in China, and the funding from the West, certainly in the uh, the Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and and uh, Star exchanges which actually helped build, if you will, Chinese biotech companies and vaccine companies. So I see it's quite circular and maybe it's not BRI, but without all the technology from the West and the funding from the West, China certainly wouldn't have uh, the biotech strength that they have today with over 370 billion market cap <laughs> in less than 10 years. Uh, and really, and Sweden's played a role. I mean, as 
Karolinska Institute has been around for 50 years. So I was training China. So I do think I, I agree with the point. Factually, it's about something else. But I just see that there's a lot of interlinkages, not just with climate change, but also with healthcare. And it's not just constrained to BRI developing countries. I'm welcoming your thoughts. No, I mean, obviously, I mean, you are right. And there is, a, there is also a big shift. I mean, the China Council for um, Economic um, Development and Environment, which I'm um, the co-chair, course, was set up basically as a Chinese institution to learn from outside world. And that when China wanted to learn from outside world is mainly meant Europe, North America, and of course, for sure, successful Asian nations like Singapore, Japan, and, and, and South Korea. But it has gradually transformed it, itself to something very different. Now it's mainly an institution for the rest of the world to learn from China uh, or to be inspired or get investments for China. Uh, of course, it, it, it never was just learning uh, one way and still is not just the, the opposite way. There's also mutual exchange of ideas, investment, best practices, technology, etc. And that's what you should uh, what you should uh, aim at um, for the future. The main constraints, I still believe, uh, are political. Uh, the idea which has got some attention in the United States uh, that we should aim at some kind of global confrontation with China, uh, decoupling um, uh, a new Cold War. Uh, it, to me, it's basically about the, uh, the non-ability of the United States to accept um, that there is a there is a equal power in the world. Remember that for the first hundred years of, of existence of the United States, uh, America was completely dominant in its own sphere. There was no competitor in, in, the, in the Americas altogether. American interest was basically in its own hemisphere. Then America became a world power from First World War onwards, and it has been unequal in the world. I mean, true, the Soviet Union was a power, but it was never and equal power to the United States in any real sense. So America has difficulties adopting to a world where most nations now have more trade with China than with the United States. Uh, and where of course, China is more and more an equal power to the United States in the world. But we should, we should welcome this because it's part of a movement to a more uh, multipolar world. To China is the, by far the most important raising power. But you mentioned Turkey a number of times. That's another very important power. India, of course, while Russia is not as important as it was, it's still a power. Brazil, uh, you can, uh, and for sure, the European Union, if you take much more hopeful world, because we have a, a huge number of power centers in the world, and we need to work together. But if we work together, we can achieve huge achievements on, the, on behalf of humanity. There was a, a question, first of all, from uh, Nikki Chablio. She says, thank you for the panelists for thought-provoking uh, presentations. I have not heard anything about Africa in this session. What would be some of the highlights to show where exactly African countries such as Zambia, South Africa, stand in this narrative? I think if you wait for the second panel uh, in my presentation, it will be mostly focused on Africa and this whole uh, context. So uh, we were going to take it up. I, I think Professor Gerachi said something about uh, the importance of working together uh, in Africa and in Asia and other, other parts of the world. If, if you wait for the second session, you will get uh, uh, surprisingly a lot on Africa in this context. But uh, if Professor Girachi wants to say something on that, or Mr. Solheim, or anyone of the other speakers on Africa specifically, on, on Africa, uh, thank you. Sen. The the view that I was uh, expressing is that uh, it's a continent that uh, will grow, and we all hope it grows. And when economy grows, we know they pollute more. Uh, so we do need to find a balance uh, that makes uh, is in the interest of the people of Africa. And the reason you, you have heard me say many times, the reason why I have uh, taken Italy to join the Belt and Road is because I think uh, the most uh, easy way for Africa to develop uh, 
is to cooperate with China in the development of infrastructure, transport, agriculture uh, alone. We have failed in the past uh, 100 years. I'm talking about Europe, even with some success stories, but on aggregate, we have not uh, delivered to Africa what they should do. Now with China, I think uh, China can deploy, deploy capital. Do they do it uh, because they're Santa Claus? No, they do it because it's in their own uh, economic interest, maybe geopolitical interest, uh, so be it. That's a normal way of doing business. That's one of the criticisms that I never really understand. People say, oh, but China is doing it because they have an interest. Uh, yes, of course. People in the morning get out of bed because they have an interest. And so we need to see if this interest that China does have is conducive to our own interest and to the interest of the African people. And I believe it is. Thank if, you. If I may, I may add to this, I think, um... Africans should allow themselves to ask the question, why has East Asia developed so fast? It's not just China for sure. I mean, Singapore, uh, Korea, before that, Japan, uh, now recently Vietnam, Indonesia is also developing very fast. There are, there are so many success stories in East Asia. In 1980, China was number 177 on the list of countries in the world measured in GDP per capita, 177. It was far below most African nations. If we go back to the 1950s, South Korea was much poorer than nearly all African states, and no one, no one predicted the rise of South Korea. And I believe there are some factors which are common for all East Asian successes that are not easily copied or uh, by Africa, but still you, you need to ask what, why. Number one, you have well-functioning strong states. You have the ability to regulate markets and set direction for the nation. Second, you have vibrant market-based economies which can establish companies and, uh, and thriving trade. And thirdly, East Asia has had a very, very firm focus on education. Uh, South Korea now probably has the highest standard of educational in the nation in the world, uh, and China is rapidly moving in the same same direction, much better than Europe okay. or, or North right. America. Uh, okay. Sorry. You worry about the. Oh, you have your computer here. Because I'm going to. Sorry, sorry. No, sir. Uh, Vietnam is now doing better uh, for the 15 years old in education than the United States of America. I mean, who would have thought that at the time of the Cold War? So I, I believe Africa will do well if they simply open up to this question, what, what, why has Africa not developed fast? And why has East Asia developed so uh, at such an extreme speed? No nation in no part of the world has developed the way East Asia has done in the last decades. And China is for sure the biggest, Singapore is, and South Korea are maybe the most successful. Vietnam is now moving. Uh, so maybe we need to ask, wh wh why did this happen and how, how can other parts of the world learn from it? Eric, so, so if I may, uh, Eric, can I ask you, so in general, what, what is the view in, in, uh, in Norway in general, the general public about uh, the role of China in Africa, this Cold War uh, environment? Uh, what's the attitude? Uh, because, you know, we are in government that sometimes uh, instead of leading, uh, we kind of need to hear what the people want. So we have uh, this trade-off between being leaders and being led. But remember, people <laughs> people have, I mean, most people, of course, have no personal view of this. So they are fed uh, the view which is in the media. Uh, and that's a story about suspicion all the time. And China uh, does exactly the same in Africa, like the West, say so invest. Uh, China, it's, it's claimed that doing this to build up some debt, people are not told that there is, there is more debt in Africa to the West than there is to China. Uh, so the, the, there is a, this, uh, a very, very dangerous uh, media conspiracy theories about China, which, which need to be countered by, uh, by more clear-sighted clear people like you and me. Uh, by the way, we had a, a full seminar, full-day seminar on Africa and the Belt and Road in uh, December 2019. Uh, the whole seminar, uh, which was in person, we had uh, many African ambassadors speaking there. And uh, so it's available on our YouTube channel. You can watch it, but we're going to discuss Africa next. 
There is a question to Mr. Sulheim uh, from uh, Tura Vesby, which I can partly answer. Any plan to publish your speech? I mean, telling the world that the West mainly talks about ambitions while China is into actions and in the lead to on solar, hydrogen, and wind. Uh, we will make available all the, the whole uh, panel, uh, but also the separate, we will have separate, the separate presentations and speeches right. of every speaker, and we will post them on our YouTube. Mr. Sulheim is free to also use it and share it and transcribe it and publish it. Uh, uh, there is a, there's a thank, question. Thank you so much. I may add that I just wrote a piece for London School of Economics. Uh, on China's uh, leadership in, on green development in the world, which I can also, also share with you. There are, of course, many of the same points which I made in the presentation today. Yes, if you have a website, uh, you can type it in the chat uh, where people can visit or read or maybe your Twitter account so people can uh, follow you, your work. You, you may type it in the chat uh, section hey, if you can. <laughs> people, people, people can for sure find it on my Twitter account, but I will also be happy to share it with you if you want to to make it available. Very good. Then you, if, if anybody wants to get that material, they can uh, send an email to our e email, Belt and Road Institute in Sweden, at info at bricksweden.org. So we can provide that uh, uh, question to Mr. Sulheim and uh, to Professor Garachi. Do you see the Chinese concept of harmony in nature and beauty as an inroad to a better cooperation with the West in, and BRI? This is a question from Mr. Ulf Sandmark, chairman of the BRICS. No, I mean, absolutely. But I, I consider that uh, a concept which is very, very close also to the thinking of all the great religions. I think someone earlier today mentioned Buddhism, but whatever great religion you were looking into, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, all of them, they all have a concept that we are stewards uh, for the planet for a limited amount of time, and we need, we need to take care of this very vulnerable planet and the nature, the animals, the plants, etc. So this idea about harmony, about, um, uh, about man and nature, I think fits very, very well into that. And there are, have been some interesting development because when Bolivia in the early days brought up the idea about Mother Earth, uh, some Western negotiators say, oh, this is very, very dangerous. We cannot speak about Mother Earth. Then it took a few years, and then Barack Obama himself started speaking about Mother Earth. And then no, all, it completely disappeared. And I told everyone, what, what, what was the difference between Mother Earth and the Christian concept that God uh, created, uh, created the planet? It's exactly the same. And of course, then China came up with the idea of an ecological civilization. Some people say, oh, oh it's very dangerous because it's a Chinese idea. But of course, isn't an ecological civilization exactly what we all want to aim at? That's the big, big, big uh, topic of the 21st century. And I, I think these ideas, Chinese ideas about harmony between nature and man, which President Xi so many times has spoken about, is fits very, very well with the thinking of other continents. So we, we should adopt them. Professor Gerachi, any thoughts on the Chinese idea of harmony between man and nature? Is that a slogan or a practice? No, oh, I do think uh, it's uh, a necessity. So the shift that China is doing to green and uh, take care of the environment uh, more, it is uh, part of a new covenant uh, that uh, the Chinese government uh, is uh, forging with the Chinese people. Before it was... Uh, pretty much uh, uh, you make money and I run the country. Now it's uh, uh, you make a little bit less money, but I clean up uh, the environment uh, for you. Uh, and now that China has uh, met uh, the primary needs of poverty alleviation, relatively well-off society, GDP uh, is about 10,000 per capita, uh, the government is delivering next stage of uh, needs, uh, which is uh, less primary on average. Of course, there are some people still poor, but uh, we're talking on large numbers. And the next thing is uh, the environment, health, uh, healthy lifestyle. It's not just uh, the CO2, uh, but it's also in general healthy lifestyle, he healthy eating habits, uh, which then moves into development of industry, of uh, nature, tourism, fitness uh, and so on. So it is uh, a natural evolution 
in my view, uh, very, very positive also because it, it takes away the financial obsession of having to make money at all costs. So there are other things uh, in life that matter. So in that way, it is indeed uh, uh, harmonious. It's like they say here, Hoysier. Thank you. Um, there's a question to Mr. Georg Finsrud from uh, Ture Vespi. Uh, it's, he says, with your knowledge from your work in China, to what extent is the Chinese or are the Chinese focused or aware of the importance of clean water? <coughs> you, oh. yeah. um, today, I know that uh, some of the some of the restrictions uh, given uh, on the treatment of uh, sewage uh, in China uh, by national law is one of the toughest in the world. But uh, when you look uh, look back um, 25 uh, years, for example, uh, it was not like that at all. Then it was more or less uh, decided from uh, um, top governmental uh, positions on what type of treatment system there were to be applied in any Chinese city. So more or less the concentration of the sewage in was the same as the concentration of the sewage out. Today, this, uh, this uh, thinking is totally different. And, and uh, as also mentioned now, uh, when it comes to culture and the, and the way of thinking uh, human nature, uh, looking at the concept I presented where engineering gets closer to the users and you think of clean access to clean water, this, this is much, much more targeted in China than it is, for example, in Norway. In Norway, we take everything for granted when it comes to, uh, to resources like that, because we have always had it. But times are changing everywhere. So uh, we can learn from China in the way of actually uh, uh, treating, uh, treating uh, in nature in, combine, in combination with us. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Ulf Sandmark to Mr. Tillman and Sulheim. Uh, what are the possibilities for Europe and especially Norway to take initiatives now to join the LNG development in Northern Sea Route? Eric, you want me to go first on that or do yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, please, 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 no, go, please go first. Thank you. Uh, so I, um, I, I, you never say never. And in fact, the, uh, the Arctic Connect cable uh, project is on hold or moving slowly. The Russians have have digitized the uh, Siberia already. That's that's just purely from Russia across the Northern Sea Route. Uh, but the Arctic Cable Route, I think, uh, connect, which I think is being led by Sinia, a Finnish company, um, is is has not uh, is still uh, you know moving along. It's and that could certainly embrace Norway and and across all of Scandinavia. I think politically, I'm not a politician, but I think politically it's more difficult now with, uh, with the routes from Estonia, from Helsinki down to Estonia and, and through the Baltics might be difficult now. But, and I also think things are moving so quickly in Russia and in all the other countries. So I see, I see movement much more south in MENA. I see, you know, I, I've seen, you, I, I mentioned briefly in my presentation, the UAE, bringing in uh, uh, transit capabilities into Vladivostok. I see, um, actually I see uh, Maersk is working on a smart port in Russia. I see, and I also see South with uh, Saudi and all the other countries, Qatar working. So I see it really moving East and South very quickly. Whether the West can make up that difference, I, I don't know. I just, I keep seeing this moving very quickly. So Eric, I welcome your thoughts, but it's, diff it's difficult to play catch up. No, I mean, I don't have a lot to add, uh, obviously, when it comes to sea routes, China and East Asia is very much uh, dominant. I mean, seven out of the 10 biggest ports in the world are in China, and all the 10 biggest ports in the world are in East Asia. Uh, and port infrastructure is, of course, also key to, uh, to taking their the shipping in a green direction. When, when it comes to the Northern Sea Route, I just want to make a, just a brief uh, word, word of caution. Of course, it opens up uh, fascinating uh, opportunities for sure. Uh, then the difference between you uh, or the distance between Europe and China and or Japan and Korea is much, much shorter uh, that, uh, that way. But it's also an extremely vulnerable ecosystem. Uh, we, we have no known technology to clean up uh, oil in, in, uh, in uh, uh, ice filled water. Uh, uh, and uh, any oil spill will remain in nature for very, very long. I mean, 
the person in the Mexican Gulf, it was disappearing very fast because of the hot water, but that, that will not be the case here in the north. So if we embark upon a more uh, normal uh, schedule through the Northern Sea Route, we need, we need to take extreme precautions. Okay, so I don't see any further questions or, or hands raised. Uh, if any of the panelists want to say something in conclusion, otherwise uh, Stephen Brower can conclude the session, the moderator. Yeah, so are there any, <clears throat> any uh, remarks? Does the, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Charles de Fer from China uh, or any of the diplomatic uh, spokesmen wish to make any short closing remarks before I close? Uh, if not, then I will say the following. I think the discussion was uh, quite uh, dynamic and uh, I wish to say that the people who participated, I would uh, very, very much welcome to return in future uh, dialogue. Uh, I think this is the necessary platform to meet the kind of negativity which uh, uh, Mr. Solheim refers to in the Norwegian press. It's also obviously a very similar problem, if not worse, in the Swedish press. Uh, but one should also understand that uh, this issue that is raised on the politicians, uh, that when if we would start to work together with Russia, with China, uh, in economic uh, projects, that would be the first step to actually resolving and stopping, as uh, Pro Professor Chirachi pointed out, the finger pointing that has no useful basis in terms of achieving any kind of uh, Socratic or, or other kind of dialogue where, of course, it is possible to disagree. I think we might have some disagreements even within ourselves. I, I'm sure that they could come up, but they are not such that they prevent uh, useful and important uh, uh, progress in, uh, in how we are going to meet the challenges that we have before us for mankind. So, in the second session, uh, in addition to Mr. Askari's presentation, which will begin, I believe, around one o'clock, I think is a good time. Uh, we can take uh, a brief half hour, approximately, where everyone can stretch their legs and maybe eat something uh, in the meantime. But I hope, I ho hope everyone <clears throat> will be able to come back. I will also speak on some of these points that I think are, have been touched on in the issue of quote nature and harmony and what are some of perhaps the underlying reasons for uh, the problem of finger pointing or the refusal to work together in these types of projects and how we can take some historical examples which uh, would help to resolve how we could go forward in a proper manner. But otherwise, I'm grateful for everyone who was a participant. And as I hope, hope for uh, all will, uh, well, as many as possible will join the second session, uh, which will begin at one. And if not, we are, uh, we will be in touch. And uh, thank you so much for a very productive uh, discussion. Uh, Mr. Erik Solheim, Professor Michele Garace, Mr. Tillman, Mr. Finsrud, um, uh, we gain only by knowledge. And when we lack knowledge, we are more vulnerable for uh, the type of uh, irrational nonsense that is preventing development of uh, of mankind's future. So let us go in that spirit. 
Okay, we will only stop the uh, recording, but the meeting will continue. I mean, we will not close the meeting uh, or this session. We will only stop the recording. So you are welcome back at one o'clock in about half an hour.